I don't know why there's an IP next to my name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we are live now. Hey, Rahama. No, Rama. The yeah, Rahama. Ramana. No, I'm <laughs> Rahama. Rahama. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. I'm so excited to have you here. Yeah, you? thanks for inviting me. Thank uh, you. Of course. Of course. I've been watching, of course, we've met before a couple of times through our mutual friend, uh, Abby. Um, yeah. I've been watching you ever since then. And your growth, in my opinion, has been so, so incredible. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, and I really love how genuine you are uh, showing up online. You share the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Uh, would you please introduce yourself to everyone that's here uh, that may or may not know you? Well, may not know you. <laughs> yeah, okay. no. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Hi, everyone. My name is Rahula Wright, and I am the founder of a social impact business called Shailene. And what my company does is we help women in Northern Ghana and West Africa uh, create value added shea butter products that we bring to the US market and it supports women in very small rural villages. And so what, how we do that is we help women take this, which is the shea seed, they transform it into shea butter, and then we create a body care line that we then connect to the US marketplace. Uh, we sell through select Whole Foods markets, MGM resorts, our website. And by creating this business model, we're helping women increase their income by five times their country's minimum wage. So it's a way of looking at a natural African resource adding value to that resource and then connecting it to a global supply chain in a way that allows women to do things like send their children to school, have access to healthcare services, invest in savings and other income generating activities. And the whole idea behind it is if these women are already making this amazing product, why not have them also benefit from this huge marketplace that exists? So how did you come up with your idea? So this show is called Beyond Inspired. Uh, a lot of people come up with ideas. A lot of people are inspired to, you know, like, you know how sometimes you can be inspired. First of all, how did you get inspired? And then second of all, how did you go about uh, really just taking action towards it? Because there's one thing to be inspired and it's a whole other thing to just go for your dream and really take it because it took a lot of action. It took a lot of challenges, I would imagine, for you to go from scratch to where you are now. How did you get inspired first? Of yeah, all? so well, one, my heritage, my heritage is Ghanaian on my mother's side. And growing up, I grew up in upstate New York, so I didn't grow up in Africa, but I was really interested in African affairs, African issues, especially around women's issues. And so after college, I decided to join the Peace Corps, which gave me the opportunity to work in a small village in Mali for two years. And that was my first time being exposed to a lot of the issues and challenges surrounding uh, women, especially women in rural communities. And I was just really struck by this, the fact that these women worked so hard, yet they just were unable to generate enough money to take care of themselves and their families. And so I started researching income generating activities. I wanted to know, like, how do women in my community make money? What are some of the things that they do that allows them to be able to buy basic household needs or um, take care of their kids and their kids to school. And as I started researching, I saw that a lot of women in my community were subsistence farmers. So they lived off the land, which is very typical for rural communities in Africa. And then the other thing I noticed was that they made shea butter. And I had bought shea butter products in New York. Um, I never knew that shea butter came from Africa. My mother is Ghanaian never knew that shea butter came from Africa. And so I thought to myself, someone who is part of the diaspora who didn't know that shea butter came from Africa, probably a lot of customers don't know either. And so people are buying this product and they have no clue that it's connected to the lives of women in these small villages. And so initially I really just wanted to create the ability for women to make shea butter. So 
give them access to production equipment, give them access to training so that they could make a high quality product um, and then connect that to large companies. But as I started delving even deeper into the supply chain, I saw that the majority of products that you see in the world that have shea butter on it, it's actually not being made in Africa. It's being made in large seed oil manufacturing facilities in Europe and Asia. So less than 10% of shea butter that leaves Africa is actually butter. Most of it is the seed. So most of it is in this form. So the fact that these women aren't even creating a value-added product is part of the problem because if you can't create a value-added product, you can't generate more money because no one's going to buy raw material at a high price because they, can, they have to incur additional costs to turn that raw material into a product and then connect it to a customer. And so as I started seeing a lot of the challenges and the way that the industry was actually set at the disadvantage of these women. And, you know, I would say intentionally because of the way colonial, you know, colonization works. Um, I said, okay, I'm going to create a brand and that brand is going to help women get value added products to directly to a customer. Yeah. And yeah, it's been an up and down journey. And I would say for people who are interested in entrepreneurship, it does not happen overnight. Um, I've been doing this for 15 years. I started in my early 20s. Uh, I had no business experience. I've never taken a business course. If I can create a business, get it to where I have, anybody can. <laughs> hi, Nikki. Hi, okay. Oh, hi, Nikki. Okay. Uh, she's just commenting. Oh, my God. I Hello. All right. So, so you've been doing that for 20 years? Oh, my God. 15. Oh, 15. Don't age me now. You're trying to ask me. <laughs> Near is my age. <laughs> I heard, uh, 20 years, but I, I, like, I Actually, know. like 14 and a half. I just yeah, 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 makes, wrapped yeah, it up. That, that makes more sense because I remember when we first met, that was really mm -hmm. at the beginning of it. And yeah, that, that was, was at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that was about yeah. That's fair, about 14. Yeah, that was before I was even yeah. developing products. That was before I was selling in Whole Foods. That was before everything. That's when I was still trying to figure out what it was I was trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so back then it was just a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you, so for you to get it from being a dream of be, being a vision, it's like, okay, I feel inspired to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like, how did you go about? Like, the, what, what, how did you know what's the first step to take? What do I need to, to go from, uh, to do to go from point A where I am right now, which is just the idea part, to where uh, I want to be? And also, did you envision that it will grow this big? Well, I knew I wanted to do something big. Yes. Um, and so I think having a big vision is very important. But in terms of how to get there, I really didn't know. And I think that's okay to not have all of the answers. The very first thing you need to do when you're starting any idea, and it doesn't matter if it's a business idea or I want to study X, I want to be the expert in this, or I want to create a nonprofit, whatever it is, your very first resource is yourself. Your very first resource is your ability to gain knowledge, the ability to become an expert. So I spent a lot of time in my early days researching and learning everything I could learn about shea butter. No one can tell me anything about shea butter. Like I know about the tree, I know about the seeds, I know about the harvest season, I know about what the equipment the women use, I know about the equipment these large processing centers use, I know about the benefits to skin, the benefits to hair. Ask me any question, I will tell you about it. And I think it's so important in the beginning to become an expert. If you are saying to the world that, you know, I'm selling this product or I'm providing this service and you don't know anything about it, that's going to uh, impact people's confidence in your abilities. And, the, and in the beginning, when you don't have money, when you don't have that huge network, when you don't have a market, when you don't even have, you know, a product, the only thing you have is the knowledge yeah. and the way to talk about it and being able to understand the problem that you're solving. And that requires doing a bit of research. It requires 
talking to people. It requires seeing what's out there, figuring out where the gaps are. And then from there, you can figure out how you are perfectly placed to address those gaps. What are you bringing to the problem that's gonna solve it in a way that no one else has thought about or that no one else is really doing, or even if someone else is doing it in a similar way, what is your thumbprint? What is you, what is what you're gonna bring to the table that's slightly different? Yeah. And so in the beginning, and I know that a lot of people in your audience might be you know, young women throughout the continent who are like, well, I'm in my community. I really don't know. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have X, Y, Z, Z, Z. Yeah. So easy for us to only focus on what we don't have. I encourage people to think about what do you have and start there. And everyone has a brain. Yeah. Everyone, everyone has, has a brain. brain. <laughs> <laughs> so starting there, everyone has the capacity to learn. Every single person in this world. If you have access to internet, that is where you start. Start researching. Everyone's on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. If you can do that, you can start researching whatever topic it is and start becoming that expert and building your confidence and being the person that people will go to. I, I remember very early on, one uh, person at my church stopped calling me Rahama and just started calling me Shea Butter because that was the only thing I would talk about. I'm sure when you met me, the only thing I could talk about was shea butter. I wasn't yeah, talking about anything else. You were so passionate about it. You were so yeah, passionate everyone was like, this girl has a problem. I, so much, I remember this because I remember how like, uh, we first met and I was so excited for you, actually, right from the back. Like, we were in Abby's kitchen. I think it was her birthday. Yeah, party, yeah. Like that, and we were talking about everything, and then shea butter came up and stuff like that. And then, and then, uh, a few months went by. And then I didn't, we didn't see each other again. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I saw your product in Oprah magazine. Yeah. And oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I was, you should have seen me and I have and my husband. Like, I was just jumping up and down. And down. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oprah yeah. Magazine. I think that was the beginning of your growth. Or were you yeah, that was a huge turning point. Yeah. Because before that, you know, you have to be able to build credibility, right? And if other people who people trust say, hey, this product is good, or this person knows what they're talking about, it helps you build your credibility. Yeah. And I remember when I was selected for the Oprah Magazine Women's Leadership Program, yeah. it really was a turning point because now everyone was like, you were, you were an Oprah Magazine, you were, you know, and people were like, you you need yeah. yeah, they wanted to learn more. And I think it is important to get those opportunities and those accolades. But that was what, like two and a half, three years into me starting my idea. And so that's a few years, right? That didn't happen the first month I said, oh, I'm going to create this for the first year. Yeah, hmm? you had to work to even get there. Right. Right. To be a lot of sweating to get exactly, there. and here was the thing I was learning so much about the problem and the issue, and I was very focused. I wasn't just taught, I wasn't just learning about um, how to grow shade trees or how to plant a shade tree, I was learning about a problem that was important to me, which was how do women in Africa benefit from the global shea butter supply chain. That was my focus. Yeah. And I would learn other things that were attached to it. But when you would talk to me, I wasn't talking about the science of shea or yeah, how to grow it or that, you know, the agriculture behind or, or the um, forestry, forest, forest science. That's not where I was playing. I was very focused on women in rural villages making shea butter, getting that shea butter out to global markets. Yeah. And so when I applied to the program, that was my focus. I help women bring value added shea to the market. And everywhere I'd go, it was didn't matter if it was at a bus stop, if it was on an airplane, <laughs> if it was on a train, if it was at the grocery store, 
anywhere, I, anyone who would give me their ear, I'd be telling them about shea butter and women in Africa. It was a, I look back on it and it was a little bit obsessive, but. <laughs> I, I, think I, I would call it passionate. That's because you were, right. yeah, you were just being true to your heart. And, I right. was, and, and from me, like from my perspective, what I saw, because we're friends on Facebook, uh, I can see a lot of. Your, it's like it wasn't just talk because you were really, really hands on. You traveled a lot to, oh, yeah. you know, to, to, to remote areas in, in mm -hmm. Africa and stuff like that. And it seemed like uh, you, were, you worked really, really hard at this. It's not just, okay, I'm talking about it, but you were really, really hands on. Action. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, not necessarily a specific quote, but the whole concept of faith without action is nothing. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I think entrepreneurship is. You can, t you know, there are people who are really great at talking, they're really great at presenting themselves, but then when you pull back the cover, they're really not doing anything. Yeah. And I think it's a balance of being able to articulate the problem, your solution to the problem, and the actions that you will take to get to the solution and make that solution a reality. And so you're right, I was traveling a lot. I went to South Sudan. I was, um, yeah, I was in room back in Yay, working with Shea Butter producers, helping them with organizing and helping them with quality control. Um, Ghana, of course, Burkina Faso, Mali. Uh, I've traveled a lot in, in Africa, um, 18 countries. And really just talking about entrepreneurship, women in entrepreneurship, youth entrepreneurship. Um, and it's been something that's important to me because I think that Africans naturally are entrepreneurs. Because for me, the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who solves a problem using a business solution um, and using a solution that generates income. And I truly believe every entrepreneur needs to be a social entrepreneur. And that means not only are you generating money from your solution, but through your solution, you're also addressing a social issue. You're looking at a social problem and you're saying, I can solve the social problem in a way that also generates money and addresses that problem. That's really important to me when we talk about Africa because you know the continent is very diverse. Every country is not the same. There are a lot of languages and cultures, but most countries face similar challenges, whether it's an agribusiness, technology, access to power, um, education, whatever it may be, access to health. And I think that to only look at the continent from the perspective of taking material, you know, whether it's bauxite, diamonds, oil, you know, take, 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 and leaving nothing behind, that's a huge problem. Yeah. And that has traditionally been how the, the rest of the world treats the continent. And so it's up to Africans to take a stand and say, no, we're going to be our own uh, solution providers. And not only are we going to provide our own solutions, we're gonna do it in a way that changes these social problems. And I think social entrepreneurship is incredibly important, especially when you think about how young the continent is. And it's the continent with the young, with the greatest yeah. amount of young people, right? Yeah. And the truth of the matter is there's not enough jobs for everyone. Mm -hmm. So when there are not enough jobs, but you are an intelligent, strong, capable individual, you have to look at solving your problems and looking at how through the, that problem solving, you can generate money, not only for yourself, but for other people in the community. Because the truth of the matter is, Small business owners are the drivers of any economy, even in the U.S. It's the small yes. business owners that are yes. giving jobs. You know, it might be a job of one person or two or three. But when you look at the numbers, small businesses are the number one employers. So would you say that, I don't know, like, I know you, you, your, your work is still like, um, uh, you still have like Sheba is still being produced and created and all that in Africa. How would you say uh, that it's impacted all the women uh, that have been uh, working at this project, on this project with you? Yeah. So I would say I focus, my business model focuses on creating living wages. 
We don't do, I know there are a lot of programs where if you buy a product, they'll give a product away. So buy one, give one. Or if you buy a product, they'll donate to a school or they'll donate to the healthcare center. That's not our business model. Our business model is even before we sell a product, a woman is making money. Why? Because when they're producing, we're giving them a living wage. How did we determine that living wage? Well, we started with the Ghanaian minimum wage, which is roughly $2 a day. And then we interviewed the women. How much does it cost to send your kids to school? How much does basic whole, whole um, household goods cost? How much does it cost for transportation? How much does it cost if you want to do another um, income generating activity? We look at all of the answers and then we create a multiplier of five. And that multiplier of five is against the the government minimum wage standard. And so by increasing a woman's income by five times her country's minimum wage, we're seeing her overcome poverty, meaning that we're seeing her advance her life and her children's life, which is what's really important to me because if a woman has access to money, she has access to choices more choices. She has access to decide where that money goes. And the number one thing women invest in are their children. You know, the number, the most important across the board, when we do interviews and um, ask the women, you know, what are you using your increased income for? It's for their kids. It's to send their kids to school. Education is so important to them. And because they see education as a way to give their kids a better life. So that's one, the financial impact. The other thing is the visibility and the voice that we're giving to an industry. And I will say, when I started um, and when you met me, nobody was talking about women in Africa and shea butter. Nobody. The marketplace wasn't talking about it. No one was even considering what's happening. I've been out here for 15 years talking about this issue. And slowly and surely, now large companies are changing the way they market. Now you see women more in the marketplace. Now all these smaller brands are popping up. And I think for the most part, it's a good thing. But the other challenge of that is people can say that they're helping and they're really not. So I still encourage people to do their research um, and investigate brands, like really ask questions. If brands aren't talking about living wages, what's the point? I honestly, if you're not making, helping women make a living wage, what's the point? Because that's what's true change. And I, I, I will say this because I know for you, if your employer wasn't giving you a sufficient wage, you'd be upset. Of course. Right? And it's the same thing for all these people. And so if you're creating a business model and you're working with communities who historically have been taking advantage of, which is the truth, and you're not talking about wages and you're not talking about living wages, what are you doing? What are you doing? So that's the, that's really important to me, but I will say that change now more and more people are like aligning and connecting that shea butter comes from Africa before, Poor people wouldn't know. I would be talking and doing presentation. People would be like, oh, I didn't know shea butter came from Africa. <laughs> consistently, consistently. And people would be like, really, tell me more. Oh, that's what, and I would show them the shea seed. And they'd be like, oh, that's what the shea seed looks like. So it's so important that African products are identified as coming from Africa. That's, that's a huge problem that the market is, in such a way that even African products, people don't connect, come from Africa. That's a problem. So the other thing is that voice and visibility. And we do that by bringing our shea product producers to the US. Um, It's not just me here talking about the issue. We've done two incredible trips where we've brought our women to the US and they went into the stores and they saw the products on the shelf and they talked to the store buyers and they talked to the customers. Of that. Yeah, of we're the that. we're the only brand that does that. Nobody else does that. Oh my god! Well, and I think the reason why they don't want their shea producers to know how much they sell the shea butter for. <laughs> <laughs> but for us, it's yeah. about really empowering. It's about really transforming. And I'm sure you know this. Uh, there is this tendency 
when working in rural villages, and Africans do this too, where we put the women under us, where it's like, we're the big, you know, the big boss. We're the ones who are saving them. Yes. And so yes. There's, a power, there's a power dynamic mm -hmm. and it's unfair and people need to stop. Both Africans need to stop as well as foreigners who go and work in Africa. These women, these populations are intelligent. They know what they're talking about. They know their issues better than us. They deserve a seat at the table and we should stop treating them like we're saving them. And for oh, me, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree because I, I, yeah, you can see that. Even though sometimes it's not like done maybe intentionally. Sometimes it's right. done even like, uh, oh, okay, I want to help, but like, I, you know, like in the back of it. Right. Yeah, unconsciously for a lot of people it happens where they feel like, oh, I'm going to, like they are in so, such bad shape and I'm going, right. I'm going to be the savior and stuff like that. But in fact, we're all in this together. Maybe we save Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. You know, maybe Absolutely. we're saving each other. <laughs> no matter Absolutely. what the are. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And for me, part of that is I know the misconceptions, you know, oh, I'm a foreigner, I'm coming into this village. I'm better already. You know how it is. If you have a passport, if you're able to buy a plane ticket, if you're able to travel to the U.S., yeah. already you're put on a pedestal. Yeah. For me, it's so important to break that down yeah. and say no. So how that do you do that? How do you do that? I'm talking like how do you do that when you're going to a village and everybody is already like putting you on the pedestal? Yeah. How do you break it? You know, like yeah. you you break it, and that's. Part of the reason bringing them here is important mm -hmm. because now it's like, I'm not doing anything that someone in your community hasn't already done. Mm -hmm. Bringing them here, making, when they were here, I wasn't doing the presentations. I was like, I'm not a Shea Butter producer. They want to hear from you <laughs> and kind of encouraging them to speak. And we would, it was so cute. We would like practice like what they would say when they would go on stage or when they would do a presentation and then they would go. That is so important because sometimes I think that we put ourselves on a pedestal. Sure, for sure. And we're like, well, I'm the one who started this. So I need to be the one talking all the time and I need to be blah, blah, blah in the spotlight. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not why I created this. One of the best things that I've experienced is having them come to the U.S. and travel to New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, Hartford, Connecticut, and just seeing that confidence come from them being able to tell their own stories, tell their own stories in front of so many different groups and seeing themselves, how they changed. That's what I, that was what the opportunity I got. And here's the thing. Sometimes we try to create like, oh, us against them, where it's like they are not going to be able to do what I do or, you know, I need to like treat them like children. No. When you give people the opportunity to rise to the occasion in their leadership, they always will because yeah. we're, we're all similar in that. I didn't I wasn't born ready to talk in front of an audience that happened over time. That, and I got better at it. When I was in college, there's no way I would have spoken in front of an audience. Now I speak in front of hundreds of people. people. I'm not you know? And yeah. it's the same thing. Opportunity. Give people opportunity instead of always taking it. And when you give people opportunity, you see their own, what they can contribute. And I learn too. I'm not the only one teaching. I also learn. And so I also think too, when in the community, if they try to like put me on some sort of pedestal, I refuse. I say, nope. Mm -mm. You know, and I, and I do things that they don't think I will do, whether it's eating with my hands, whether it's, you know, sleeping on the same mat that they sleep on and not asking for any additional stuff. Yeah. Eating the same food, drinking the same water. You know what I mean? Just being with them where they are. Yeah. And that is something that I think a lot of us don't do when we're when we work in development, which is unfortunate because have it creates. Always, have you always felt this way, or like did it just like expand or 
uh, did you grow into this, like into this feeling? No, I think it's my mom. My mom has always been this way. And that's how she raised me and my, my siblings. Yeah. She was very, always, the door is always open for anyone who needs help. There was never this whole, we're better than anyone or, you know, always treat people with kindness and respect. Like that was always something she drilled in our heads. It doesn't matter what you have. It's the way that you treat people. Mm -hmm. And that's ever since I was little, I've always been very sensitive to unfairness, very sensitive to justice issues. First, I thought I was gonna be a lawyer because I wanted to fight for people in law. And then I realized, honestly, it's businesses that make change. Yeah. Businesses are the change drivers because when you have access to money, you have access to power. And a lot of these issues that we see, even today with COVID-19, oh, yeah. it's how, how people in power make decisions and how those decisions affect everyone else. But if you see how they got to power, there's a direct link to money. Yeah. And so, so I see- yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I was I just gonna say, I, I, I see the connection between true change and your ability to impact people's life through business. So you talked about funding earlier. So you've been able, this is a very good segue actually, uh, you've been able to kind of secure funding in some way for, uh, for, for your business. Uh, how did you do it? Like for anyone that's watching now, and, uh, and this was major funding, I, I see you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how were you able to do it? For anyone that's watching now and thinking, oh, I wish I could do that. Well, the thing about funding is I didn't get funding until about eight years into my business. Mm -hmm. So I self-funded, I bootstrapped, you know, I raised money through friends and family. And when it comes to people of color, when it comes to women, honestly, that's their, our reality. Less than 0.01% of venture capital goes to black women. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? So not even 1%, mm, yeah. not even, yeah. less than 0 0.01. Yeah. So that means so we, have much, we have a much harder time. And initially yeah. it's gonna be through your own money. Yeah. And it's gonna, so I think a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I need to go raise money before I can start. And unfortunately that's just not the reality of our demographic. So saving your own money invest being your first investor is the experience of many of us if you have friends and family who you trust to help you as well but now when it comes to getting significant capital it's really important to have i would say two or three things the first one is have a very clear plan and understand <laughs> the front Store in Atlanta. She just said, "Oh my God, thank you for sharing. I'll be adding this product to my store." So, you ah, know, so thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, so, when it comes to funding, first thing is have a plan about how your business makes money. A lot of people are very comfortable with marketing their business, right? They like the colors of their logo. They spend a lot of time <laughs> on the brochure, <laughs> the website. <laughs> spend time on your financial model. What does that mean? How does your business make, make money? money? How does yeah. it make money? Who are your customers? How much do you charge them? How much revenue do you get in a month? What are your expenses in a month? When will you break even? Do you know the answers to those questions? And a lot of people are like, if you, I know, if you, like I see the actually, even I was in that boat before, like when I was in business, I was so like on the surface level, it looks good or from the outside. But if your business is not making money, what the hell are you doing? Excuse me, I, I hope YouTube doesn't say yeah. for this. Is yeah. You see what I mean? And uh, 
uh, and I think it's a lot of it is also like focus. Like if my focus is more about uh, the the outside stuff, and my focus is not on, I actually need to bring money into this. Then business is not going like it's just going absolutely. To and absolutely. the other thing is, that I feel like I don't know if you felt this yourself ever. Uh, a lot of women uh, have some sort of guilt around money. Right? Mm -hmm. or some sort mm -hmm. of guilt about around like receiving money or 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 even asking for money. Right? Have you ever felt that way? Or for oh you, yeah. It's always, it's mm -hmm. always, yeah. Well, for me, I've always I'm the eldest of five kids. Okay. I'm not very shy. Like <laughs> I'm not afraid to ask for anything. <laughs> but that is not normal when it comes to women. Yeah. Um I, I never, and I think it really is because I was the eldest child, because my siblings are not like this. But I've well, always- I'm the eldest child, but I did have that issue. Okay, maybe that is, that's <laughs> what me. I'm also a Leo, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting, because my sister is a Leo, like she was, she's born in August, and she's never shy about asking anything. Ever. No, I'm not, I, I don't understand. I'm like, well, if I don't ask, I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> So that's never been my problem. My problem, I would say, is I like to control everything. And so it's hard for me to let go of control. So when you're in business, if when you're trying to scale, when you get to a point where you're scaling, you have to let go of control and give the ability for other people to manage projects. Yeah. And that has been what my challenge. But asking for things, no. Nope. <laughs> Nope. So would you say you are done with that? Like, are you, have you grown into like out of that challenge, or are you still, you still, you know? No, I, it's much better. It's much better than it was five years ago. One hundred percent, much better. And I think it's a combination of finding the right people um, that you know you can trust, finding the right people who say what they will do. My big thing in life is if you say you'll do something, do it. Yeah. If you if, it, if the words come out of your mouth and you say you're going to do something, do, do it. it. Okay. And I think a lot of people don't have that same. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll do this. But then they're like, mm, I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm not like that. That's, hmm? When it becomes challenging. Right. Right. Especially like being yeah. wishy-washy. And that's just never been my personality. That's why I'm still doing this. Because I told yeah. the women, I'm going to do this. So well, I yeah, keep well, moving forward. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, like, I have come to uh, a place now where I, where I know that like whenever you say you're going to do something, especially uh, if it's something you've never done before, you can expect to have challenges. You can expect to have challenges. Would you say that for you, one of the like the biggest, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like qualities, right? That you have is having the ability to really not only face the challenges but embrace them. Because mm, I'm not yeah. to a point where like actually challenges have become very exciting for me mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely. I agree with you. It's a mindset issue. Yeah. I think many of us are raised to see challenges as problems. And when you see something as a negative, you yeah. then your mindset around it has blockages, right? Yeah. yeah. And we grow up in, well, many of us grow up in environments where it's like, we don't, we're not trained, we're not training our kids to, see challenges as learning experiences, mm -hmm. as testing, you know, your your abilities, yeah. as helping you improve. We see, we're like, oh, this is a challenge. Well, I'm just gonna give up. Yeah. Well, and, and it's a, it's I'm a failing problem. at this. Like, yeah, I'm failing at this, so oh. why bother? Yeah. But when you change your mindset and you see a challenge as, I'm actually gonna learn something. This is gonna teach me something. Yeah. This is going to make me stronger. This yeah. is going to make me better. This is good. This is part of the process. That's the other thing that you oh, said that I do. That. I know, it's part of the process. For me too. Yeah, yeah. When you see it as, oh my gosh, I'm the only one dealing with this. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? And you see it as 
being outside of the process, then you lose the value of the of the challenge and the experience. And I've had to tell myself, regardless of what challenge I've gone through, this is part of the process. Because then when you realize that this is part of the journey, it's easier for you to not only be more open and accepting to it, it's easier to change your mindset so that it becomes, I'm going, I'm one, I know I'm going to overcome this. I don't know when, but I know I'm, every challenge I've overcome. Some I overcame in a couple of weeks. Some was a couple months. Some was 10 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> but eventually you overcome them. But you're going to overcome it. You just don't know Especially the time. when you don't give up, yes. And the other, you know, if I quit in year three, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, the achievements of year seven. If I quit in year 10, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, the experience of year 12. So, and I always say this, brands do not happen in years. They happen in decades. Yeah. Let's say it again. Brands do not happen in years. They happen in decades. It's so funny because, like, I used to be one of the guilty people doing this. Uh, we'll be like, a, you know how, like, we'll see maybe a brand or somebody else is, like, doing their business. And they are somewhere. We think that we, we're just starting now. And uh, oh. we must be over there. And if we're not there overnight, or if we try something that they're doing and we didn't get the kind of result, that kind of result, then we're like beating ourselves up and yeah. saying, oh, I failed. And then we give up and stuff like that. Not knowing or forgetting that for them to get to where they are, they worked their behinds <laughs> up. That they yeah. didn't put it. Yes, even, even a lot of the time, this has been a huge realization for me is that for a lot of people, for a lot of entrepreneurs, actually, they've been working behind the scene without anybody knowing it for years yeah. before they started being seen on yeah. the public eye and stuff like that. And, and so it's harder. It's harder, too, because social media makes it seem so beautiful and amazing and I got my awesome. you know my Louis Vuitton bag and I'm you know entrepreneurs are just look so beautiful and walking down the street beautiful <laughs> photos that it's just so fun it's not like that <laughs> and I think it makes it harder because you start comparing yourself Oh, why am I, why is my life not like that? Why is this person getting on TV and getting these orders and doing yeah. this? And I just feel like I'm failing. I'm not good enough. That self-talk is very dangerous. Yeah. You cannot compare your journey to someone else and think you will be successful. It's not possible. No, no. When you start comparing your journey to other people, it does not empower you. It will always make you feel worse because the grass is always greener on the other I'm side. The side. When yes. you don't know the photoshopping and the editing they had to do before <laughs> they put that picture on, you know, they had to move and like make sure they were <laughs> sitting on the car the right way and like <laughs> you don't know any of that. And so for you to compare yourself to someone else's photoshopped image is ridiculous. It's one of the saddest parts of our society. And that's why, for me, I always try to make sure when I post something, I'm being very open and honest about my journey. I've talked about, you know, I've talked about earlier on, I had to like sleep on a blow up mattress in my friend's apartment because I lost my apartment. I lost my car. Like I was completely broke. Yeah. That is part of the journey. Yeah. That is part of the process. <laughs> And I think that it's really sad when people start following false narratives. And, yeah. and I also think it's very dangerous when people start following money and following people who only talk about money. Mm. Yes, money is important. And money shouldn't be something that we're afraid to have. Mm -hmm. But it's not, the, it's not the thing you should pursue in life. Everything I've gotten is because I was pursuing a change. I was trying I to change a problem. Yeah. And yeah. all these blessings and all this favor came. It might not have come as swiftly as someone who might have just been sell trying to sell you know, a product. Yeah. But it still came in an amazing way. I mean, I got to meet President Obama. 
I, I never could have planned that. that. The first you black president of the United you States. Yeah, are, I was appointed to his advisory want? council on doing business in Africa. Who who could have put that in a business plan? Nobody. <laughs> you can't plan that. You did that for even the two terms that I'm, he was in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I'm actually currently on it under this administration, but we can talk really? about that off, offline. <laughs> we can talk about but that I, offline. <laughs> been, oh my God. So it's been what? Like the, it's been so this is my third term so it's i'm entering two four five my fifth year yeah oh, wow. but i'm saying that i'm saying that because it's so important for me to tell your audience this is sometimes we follow the wrong things and it gets us off path and social media makes it very easy for us to convince ourselves that the real thing we need to follow is money the real thing we need to follow is this this, 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 this. And we ignore the voice inside of us that already has all of the answers. Anytime I share my entrepreneurial journey, it's just my story. Your story is going to be different. It's supposed to be different. And, you, and your dream, what moves you and what your dream is, is going to be different than anybody else. I agree. And, and it's okay. That. Yeah, and when you follow that, this is what I have seen. When you follow that, it will definitely not look like anybody else's. It will be scary like crazy. It will be scary, like, but like I feel like it's the most fulfilling thing that you can do. And then mm -hmm. the rest actually comes more easily. Yes. Yeah. When you try to become something you're not, you're only putting yourself at a disadvantage. And I think a lot of people... The one thing that you should be so good at in life is to be able to hear from yourself. Mm. Is to be able to yeah. know what you is in your speaking gut. my language. You know what is in your heart. That is all we before you die, please do that for yourself. And the reason why is that we get so distracted and we follow so many false narratives. We forget our own story. We forget our own narrative. And everyone's narrative is beautiful and deserves to be heard and deserves to be seen. You, you owe that to yourself in your life. And it makes me very sad when people compare themselves to everyone else, realizing when you do that, you're putting, you're putting out your own light. And there's a reason why you were born. There's a reason why you are here. And for you to do that to yourself is, it is actually, to me, it makes the world the way that it is because people follow things that are not meant for them. They follow things that are not authentically theirs. And it's why we have the world that we do. Yeah. Instead of going inside and learning yourself more than anything else. And I think it's, it's because... So, I, I think it's so interesting that our conversation brought us to this space because this is what I am like. My work, this is what it's all about. It's mm. like we have to go from within. We have to really... Like that's the, like, that's the foundation for everything, to hear everything. ourselves. When we can everything. hear ourselves, we can hear our dream. We can hear what our heart is telling us. We can, even though it may not look flashy at first or even though okay. it may not look like what other people or the society or the bling bling saying we should be having. But if we follow that instead, uh, I feel like there's something so hugely fulfilling about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing too is I think that most of us go through life thinking that we're broken, thinking something is wrong with us, thinking like, you know, we go, I and it's like, the reason we had to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the biggest lie of all. And There's if you, you don't, fix. yeah, there isn't. There's, there's, instead of looking at it as I'm not good enough or something is wrong with me, everyone else is better than me. Instead of looking at that, in that way, ask yourself, what am I learning? What am I feeling? A lot of people don't even know what their emotions are. Yeah. They don't even know. Like if you were to ask them how they feel, they don't even know. They don't. Yeah. But yeah. this is the great news. Everyone has the ability to work on that.
And some of it, I'm a big believer in going to therapy. I'm a big believer in like finding someone who can help you figure that out. I'm a big I'm believer. A big believer in utilizing energy, the power of energy to connect with yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it can also be the foods that you're eating that don't align yes. with you. It can be what you're drinking. It can be your lack of sleep. All of these things. And so, it, it there are a lot of people who are have trauma, and they're trying to be leaders. It's that's the worst. Yeah. If you have trauma and if you haven't worked on yourself and you're trying to be a leader, it's only going to create disaster. Why? You won't be able to lead a team. You yeah. won't be able to be your best self. Not because you don't have the ability to, but because you haven't taken the time to heal, to understand yourself. How can you lead other people if you can't even understand your own self? Yeah. And I think so really a lot of time. To, yeah. And I think and really it comes to like self awareness, really like yeah. being, yeah, really. emotional intelligence, all of that. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we don't talk about this when we talk about business. Yeah, but it's so important. Any kind, I you know, like being on the advisory council, I've been fortunate to be around like major like CEOs of multi billion dollar companies, and I've noticed certain habits. One, they always wake up early. They are very, uh, you know, they they exercise, they eat well, they, you know, the physical performance, like, and and they're always on it. And I was like, you know, I'm looking at myself. I'm like, I need to get my life together. I need to start running. I need to start. <laughs> I need to start doing some push up. But these are people who are like in their 50s and 60s, and like so they're funny. running major, think, major yeah. companies. And they're like getting up at 5 a.m., like, you know, re yeah. reading the news, being up on the news. And it's always a performance. It's always about how are you performing? How are you making sure that everything spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically, how are all those things healthy and working on that? And if you can't do that and instead you're on Instagram all day, looking at what this person posted, Twitter, and, uh, Facebook, and eating back yourself. for yourself, eat, you know, eating ice cream while you're watching all <laughs> that's not going to help you. And so I really want your audience to think about how am I treating myself? How am I loving myself? How am I appreciating myself? And a lot of times we think that's selfish. That's, you know, you're, you know, you're being selfish. No, especially for women. But no, it's like you have to take care of yourself first. If you want to be able to be successful, it's showing up in the world the way you're awesome authentically supposed to show up. Now, I want to really quickly go back to the question about funding, because I don't think I finished that answer, which is, okay. Okay. yes, I talked about having a plan, knowing, yes. you know, how you're solving that plan, knowing how you're making money is so important, knowing your expenses, all of that. Focus on your financial model. Do, you know, who is your customer? And this is whether you're building a service business or a product-based business. Who's your customer? A lot of people can't even answer that. I, you know, with um, the, a go on Africa Growth Opportunity Act, when I do presentations, people are just like, oh, I'll just sit, ship it to the US. And I'm like, okay, who's gonna buy it? <laughs> just shipping something to the US doesn't mean anyone's gonna buy it. But there's this misconception that, oh, all I need to do is just ship it. Hmm. No, who's gonna buy it? Yeah. Is it gonna be a store? Is it going to be a wholesaler? Is it going to be direct to consumer? Who is it? Is it going to be an older person, a young person? Is it going to be a mother? Who Who's your market? Who's your customer? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't spend enough time with that. They want to focus more on my logo, my website, the color. Oh, we lost her. How are you going to make money? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing when it comes to funding is you have to really develop the right relationships. Funding comes from relationships. People put money in people they trust and that they know. And so develop the right relationships, right? So that means whether it's relationships from school, professional organizations you're a part of, your church or synagogue or mosque communities, whatever, you know, religion or whatever you practice, being able to develop those 
relationships are very important. Um, I met my funders through a personal connection. We had a call, we vibed on the call. It took nine months from start to finish to actually get the funding. It doesn't happen wow. overnight. You have to go through a due diligence process. Mm-hmm. When you, and the other thing too is not all funding is perfect for you. So understand the different types of funding. Do you need an angel investor? Do you need grants? Do you wanna do crowdfunding? VC venture capital is not for everyone. So understand the different types of funding because a lot of people are just like, oh, I just want money. (laughs) What does that mean? What does that mean for you? Do you want smart capital? Because smart capital is just different from capital. What's smart capital? Google it. Yeah. Do research. research. Do there are some funds that invest just in technology. They're not gonna look at you. It doesn't matter how great your plan is. They only invest in technology. So understanding the different um, investment thesis of each fund. There are some that only invest in agriculture. They only invest in emerging markets. They only invest in women. They only invest in black women. They only invest in, you know, whatever you can think of. So really understanding and aligning yourself. And this is so important because No one said this to me when I was first fundraising, which is not all capital is the right capital for you. Just like not all relationships are the right relationship for you. (laughs) Because when you sign on that bottom line with an investor, that's a marriage. Same thing as a marriage. You got to make decisions together. You're going to disagree. Does this person know how to problem solve? Does this person respect you? Yeah, it's the same thing. And I think that and it goes back to the power dynamic we were talking about before. People who are looking for money are always seen as being in uh, the position of less power. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. you're also, not in a position this, of this less power. This is a very good point. So like, it, it's kind of like what you're saying is even when you are the one of uh, you know, needing funding, you know the value that you're bringing to even the person Absolutely. that's going to bring to, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to take from you, but I'm bringing something to the table and you're bringing something to the table. And it's a win-win situation for all Exactly. Of yeah. Here's the thing. If you're working with investors and you can't call them on your worst day, don't work with those investors. <laughs> no, I'm being serious. Because yeah. business is hard. You'll have incredible days. You have bad days. If you're working with an investor and you're scared to tell them one of my contracts didn't come through, that's the wrong investor. Don't even think about it. Don't do it. Because guess what? There are investors out there that will want you to call them when you're having a bad day. That will not only want you to call them, that will tell you it's going to be okay. We'll figure it out together. That's when it comes from like really having, coming into it from the... Uh, mindset of abundance knowing that there's plenty of people first of all knowing that you yourself have so much value to give but also to know that because I have so much value to give there's plenty of people out there that would be willing not only that really match what uh, my own requirements which means you also have to have your own requirements for what an investor must be not just anybody that's willing to give you money but like right. Can... <laughs> right yeah. Absolutely. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. If you haven't done your self work, mm-hmm. if you haven't focused on that, you'll take anything. So you know what I mean? You feel you like, oh, I'm lucky that this person's even paying me any attention, which is the worst place to be in, yeah. <laughs> whether it's in business or in personal relationships. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in any kind of relationship, really. Yeah. Even with, even with like the moms and kids yep. and, and yep. you know, husband and wives and mm-hmm. investors and investees and like, I think in any and I think it really comes down to really knowing and feeling your own value. right absolutely not just and knowing just, and thinking that I have value but really feeling right value. yeah yeah and I think too it's like people are very hard on themselves most people are it's okay a lot of us, we've been raised this way since children. We've been raised this way and it's okay. It's not, you know, what is not okay is 
as an adult not addressing these things and finding a better way. Because then you're repeating things that you'll pass down to your children, they'll pass down to their children. And that cycle does not get broken. And I think that everything in life, every single thing in life is relationships, everything. Everyone with business, everyone wants to focus on money, but it all goes to relationships. So I would say- What do you say? For me, the way that I look at it, it's not only relationship with others, but also it's sort of my relationship with myself. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, Yeah, relationship with myself. And then really like that radiates uh, to like my relationship with with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I totally agree with that. So you've been able to create this like phenomenon. I call it a phenomenon. Like really from like uh, from you know, like meeting you in Abby's kitchen and then before, like, before I knew it, you were, like, at the White House. Before I knew it, you were, like, in Whole Foods uh, stores, <laughs> like, in most Whole Foods stores now, right, in the country? We're, yeah. we're in three regions in the Northeast. Three regions. That's, like, the D.C. area, New York area. And Boston area. And Boston area. Mm-hmm. And yeah. For, for you to go from all that to here, uh, Here's what, one question that I have for you. You've changed a lot, right? You like even internally, you've changed. You definitely not the same person that mm-hmm. you were like 13 years ago, 14 years ago. You mm-hmm. know, like I met you, you were an amazingly beautiful, really so. Like I thought that from the very first time that I, I, I met Thank you. you. Would, you, would you say that uh, uh, having this big vision for yourself? has transformed who you are like having this big vision and focusing on it has made you like change internally like uh, into really even like personal development when it comes to that oh yeah yeah, for sure um i don't think that any other job would have tested me emotionally spiritually mentally as being an entrepreneur um it's it's made me think differently about life. It's made me look within myself more. It's made me see where my strengths are and where my weaknesses are. Um, I just don't think any other thing or job would have really impacted me this way. Um, And I think part of it is being an entrepreneur is like being an artist, right? Um, you have something inside of you. You believe in a world that doesn't exist yet. And every day you're working towards achieving that. And some days you feel very close to it. And then other days you feel like you've been set back. And that emotional up and down roller coaster requires having not only internal fortitude and persistence, but I also am starting to see now it requires having um, grace and kindness and self-awareness and um, things that we don't seem to talk a a lot about when it comes to business because it's like everyone wants to focus more on how much money did you make this quarter or how, you know, how well are you doing? How many stores are you in now? And that is definitely a part of it, but it's also who are you as a person? What are your values? What are you trying to create? Why is it important that you create this? Um, how, how does this improve humanity? How does it make us better people? Oh and <laughs> and I think and I think that I just don't know how any other journey could have impacted me in the way that it has. And I feel like I'm a much better person than I was when you first met me because there was a lack of awareness back then or or a, a lack of understanding um like who like who and understanding and fully accepting who i was um and i think over the last you know 15 years y- y- everyone will grow in 15 years and it just depends on what direction you want to grow in right yeah. do you want to be more embracing um, more accepting, more understanding, give more grace? Um, or do you want to be like hardcore? like? <laughs> and I think I've moved from being that very like 
you know, results driven, numbers driven to, you know, impact driven, which I still am to being more open to the softer side of entrepreneurship. Because I feel like if you can get that, it actually propels you forward much quicker. Would you say like this is my own personal belief, but would you say that uh, uh, the world is changing in a way that more and more uh, people naturally are going towards or naturally um, leaning towards being more heart centered in their businesses, being more uh like more like for humanity more for like for all of us as opposed to just me 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 do you think it's different now than it was when you first started absolutely yeah i do i do and i think it's because of social media i think it's because of you know the positive side of social media is that you get to see other people's experiences um and connect with people that you may not have not have ever had an opportunity to do Um, you, you know, even what we're doing now, sharing our stories and our experiences, that's going to connect with someone in some way. And for that, for that happening more frequently, yes, the world is becoming much more heart centered. I also think because of what we've seen in politics the last few years and the hatred that has been spewing um, in so many fronts, it's it's shaking us up. And I think it's making people. Uh, realize that the freedoms that we enjoy mm. need to be protected. Yeah. Our neighbors need to be protected. We cannot allow for some of the destruction that we've seen. Oh. And I think that by by being exposed to a lot of the injustices in a very real way, mm. um, it's making people rethink the type of society they want to live in. Um, and I think that's a good thing. It also shows us that in order for change to happen, you have to experience difficulties. Um, I think, you know, and I think that even right now with everyone locked up in their home, not locked up, but (laughs) at home because of COVID-19, it's showing us that you can plan as much as you want to plan. You can have the best life ever, but there's a lot of things we do not have control over. I don't have control. That's one. And then two, we are very interconnected. Someone gets sick all the way in a different country. Now the whole world is sick. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's that's such a big that's a big awareness, right? Like knowing that whatever happens in, on the other end of the world, we are so one now that we can't say if it happens to this other country, they are so remote that it's not going to happen to me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that there, there's a reason we're experiencing that now. Um, and I'm really praying and hoping that this does change society, not just American society, but everywhere, oh, where we can truly become keepers of each other, meaning that we're taking care of our neighbors, not only who are immediately next door to us, but that neighbor who's thousands of miles away in another country. Um, and I do think. Uh, especially younger generations, because they've grown up in, in so much technology, what they care about is very different. Um, they do care about the environment more. They, mm-hmm. they are more intentional about how they spend their money. Um, and they want better products that are made ethically. No one wants to buy something that was made you know, in a sweatshop in India, yeah. Yeah. Um, people are becoming more and more sensitive about how the money they, they use to buy a soap. Who made the soap? How did the soap get here? Is it helping someone? Or is it taking advantage of someone? Um, and not only that, is it good for me? Is the food that I'm eating good for me? Is the and is it good for the environment? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I, I definitely agree with that. And I pray that it continues in a big way because I think the failure of society is if we continue to divide ourselves and not realize that we're all in this together. We need each other to survive. By taking care of each other, it's actually yeah. painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
your audio went something. Something happened to your audio. Did something oh, change? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you, but it's like kind of far away, the audio. Oh, Did I don't you? know what happened. I haven't changed it. <laughs> Is it better now? <laughs> maybe can you get closer maybe to see? Is I don't it better know. Now? I don't know what happened. It just went off. Should I come back in? Okay, I'll wait for you. Okay. Okay, we can do that. Hey, Lillian. Hello, Lisa. Thank you for being here. Hi, Lucretia. So true. I love that. First, you change, not money. Yeah, so much more fulfilling. I couldn't agree more. Hi, Nikki. I'm going to go to overcome, overcome, overcome you. Thank you, ladies, for the motivation. Anytime. We are so glad you are here. Welcome back, Rahama. Can you hear me now? Yes, the audience is back. I don't know what happened. I also took the opportunity to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, it's it's been so amazing to have you here. I knew that was Thank you. Uh, I needed to have you on the, this is actually the very first episode. Uh, what? I know I'm awesome. really, really, uh, <laughs> to have you here. So my goal here is to really uh, bring um, like entrepreneurs like you, bright entrepreneurs that are very like open hearted and open, open heart centered and yes. really share genuinely uh, the, the, the journey so that it can really show others or encourage others that are aiming to do the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And like really, kind of, you really showed the behind the scene a lot today. Mm. Uh, not thinking about whatever is social on social media is the it thing and all the process and stuff like that. Can you tell us about you know? I have actually this was years ago. Now I have my own statue for uh, of Shea Baro from back. You know how like I yeah. go back home yeah. and they always bring it back. Like way back when I was in Maryland, you probably don't know this, but I used to order from your website. And I love, 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 love your products. Can you tell everybody uh, what are the products that you sell on your website? I know, like, like if they go to Whole Food in the uh, north, East, northern eastern, uh, in North mm -hmm. East America, like, yeah. which products should they look for, and what's your favorite one? I know okay, it's like your babies, but I know. <laughs> oh, well, they can go to our website, shailene.com. Yeah. Um, and I can actually, let's see if I can write it in here. Perfect. Yes. Oh, maybe not. Did it, did you write it? No. Uh-oh. Okay. So I'll type, I have her, her website here. I'll, I'll type it and I'll put it in the, uh, in the, in the description later. Uh, while we're waiting for her to come back. If you have any questions uh, for her, when you come back, please type the questions now. We will be happy. I hope you are enjoying this. I hope you've been enjoying our conversation here. Lucretia said, in my industry, most entrepreneurs are full-time. It's a hard building. Oh, okay, she's back. Something happened. Yeah, I can't, I can't, do, I can't do the... Um... The typing. Yeah, I can't. If, if for some reason I'm like, I'm not letting me. Your audio went really bad again. My oh my husband, gosh! I'm like, yeah. Is it, still, so, is I, it bad I, again? Yeah, I'll put the link myself also. Right. Um, Lucretia said, uh, okay, so I am, uh, most entrepreneurs are full time. Full time in the entrepreneurship or full time in uh, uh, the working, and then they also have the entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a hard building a business. While, oh, while still working, a uh, full time job. It's main course. It's it's my main course of income providing for my family. I'm exhausted. Exhausted. Any advice? Okay, can you hear me, Rahama? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So, Lucretia, are you back? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Lucretia, Lucretia had this uh, this question. She says, "In my industry, most entrepreneurs are full time. It's a hard building a business while still working a job full time. It's my main source of income, providing for my family. 
I'm exhausted. Any advice? I know that you were working full time mm -hmm. when yeah. you started your business. Any yeah, so for the majority of Shailene, so until I got funding in 2014, I was working um, full time for a few years, but then I would work jobs that allowed me flexibility. And so I was very intentional in getting jobs where I had control over my schedule. Yeah. Um, and that gave me the ability to have income coming in while building and growing my business. So for those of you who are working full time and trying to get your business off the ground, a couple of things that I would suggest, which is making sure that you're saving money, because earlier on in your business, you might not uh, get the same amount of revenue to be able to quit your full time job and work on your business full time. So just make sure that you are saving enough money. So when you get to a point where you want to leave your job, you have enough in savings that will keep you um, and your family until you get to a point where you can pay yourself at, as you're operating your business. In terms of managing, it's really uh, important that you have a work plan. And so making sure that when you have time, because time is limited because you're working 40 plus hours somewhere else. So, you know, during the time when you are working on your business, make sure you're working on the things that are moving the needle forward in terms of either crystallizing your product or your service or you whatever mean, it may be. You, you mean no logos and no colors? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't focus on that stuff. That stuff can come later. But you know, building your financial model. Um, I believe in business plans, but also not really because I think that business plans are great to like get you focused and answer important questions. But I think more so than the business plan is having like an implementing plan. So whether it's a work plan or a strategic plan, where you have listed out in very great detail what you are going to do and when you are going to do it. Because, you know, my business plan, I haven't looked at in forever, but I do look at my strategic plan. I do look at my work plan. I do see how, how far I've gone in achieving one goal. And then you might realize that you're going, you know, down the road on in trying to achieve one goal, but then something else comes up that is actually makes better sense for you. And so it allows you to kind of like evolve your plan while you're working on it. Um, but you will need a business plan if you're doing accelerators or, you know, trying to fundraise and things of that nature. So it's important to have that, but also a strategic plan that you're working on. So when you have, you know, let's say five hours a week to work on your business, that's not a lot of time. So making sure that the time you're using is very intentional and driving you forward in terms of developing your business. And the other thing too, is maybe look at, are you in a position instead of working full time, can you work part time? Um, are you in a position to maybe do work that might give you a little bit more flexibility so you can manage your hours a little bit more, which is the route I chose because I was traveling. I was traveling everywhere. I mean, I've traveled to like 36 countries. I couldn't do a nine to five. It just wasn't something that would work for me. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I hope that answered your question, Lucretia. <laughs> All right, so oh, we've been. I could, I could be here with you forever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> here for about an hour and a half. Can you believe it? Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> I know it does. So, what is okay before we go? What is one sentence that you, or uh, one phrase, or one, one you know, like I guess, um, philosophy that you live by? Like, if there was like one sentence that. Are you on the show with the world? Like, what would that yeah. be like? Yeah. One sentence. Jeez, Louise, that's a hard one. <laughs> I mean... You said I, surprise you. <laughs> I know, you did. You were like, I'm going to throw in some wrenches with my questions. Um, I mean, I think for me, what I tend to always go back to is that this is a faith journey. Um and I can't always rely on what I see. Um, I also have to like rely on what I believe. Um, and 
for me, it's, you know, it ties into my spirituality, it ties into my Christian practice. And simply that, you know, there is, there's a reason why I feel so strongly about this. And to not underplay um, the very real emotion I have around changing this global supply chain. And so I would say just that, you know, we tend to rely so heavily on what we see um, and we tend to undercut what we think and believe because of what we see. And if any great movement or any great story has shown us anything about life, whether it's a story in, you know, in a spiritual text or it's a story in the life of, of someone that we know, is that there's always something more than what we can, than what we can see, right? There's always something more. Um, and I'll just really briefly share a very quick story about one of my friends who for years, for years was having a very difficult time getting pregnant. Like mm. I would say over a 12 year period mm. and you know, she's getting older and you know, it just was not happening for her. But she said, I know I'm supposed to have two children. And it was kind of one of those things where, you know, in the beginning, everyone's like, yes, yes. But after so many years of not being, you know, getting pregnant and the pregnancy, you know, not resulting in a child or something happening. And it just kept happening over and over and over to the point where I was just kind of like, you feel like you're a bad friend if you keep encouraging it. Mm-hmm. Because you're just kind of like, this doesn't look like it's part of your story, even though you believe it. Yeah. We're seeing something else. Yeah, you keep, you know, having miscarriages. Maybe God doesn't have this for you. And she was just so adamant that she was supposed to have two children. And, <laughs> and it got to a point too where it was just like, how do you comfort her and give her good advice, but at the same time not seeing and believing in what she was seeing and believing? Yeah. And I kid you not. The last time her and her husband, it was their final attempt to get pregnant. And they, you know, used science um, with in vitro and all of that stuff, which they had done before, spent thousands of dollars and it never turned out for them. She got pregnant with twins. And she now <laughs> has two healthy girls. And I and I'm someone who I tend to have faith, like, but that situation, I was just kind of like. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> right? Because based on what we were seeing, the evidence, the evidence, the physical yeah. evidence was yeah. saying, this is not for you. Yeah. But something else in her heart told her, I'm supposed to have two kids. She, even her doctor was surprised that she got pregnant with twins. She wasn't supposed to get pregnant with twins. It was supposed to be one child. One child. And it turned into twins. How did that happen? How did that happen? I share that story because if you look enough, you will be able to see so many examples of how faith changed a situation in a way that makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. That's just one of millions. And so I always go back to, I cannot let, what my eyes show me deceive me to what I believe in my heart. And I choose because it's a choice to have faith in what I don't see. And that's where the actions come from. I was hearing you say that I can get goosebumps. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And I choose. That's a choice. You can choose and yeah. Believing only what you see. Yeah. Or you can choose to believe what is so deep in your heart. It's hidden, but it's trying to come out. Yeah. That's what I choose. That's the life I choose. And I don't know where it's gonna take me, but I know it's gonna take me to much greater things than just believing what I see. You know what? I can't wait to see what's next for you. <laughs> I like I'm like, even though like we may not necessarily talk all the time or anything like that i want you i see you and i cheer for you all the time i cheer thank for you, you. So it has thank been so <laughs> thank you so much for saying yes to being here with me absolutely um, and, and uh, congratulations 
Oh, thank you. To you. <laughs> Many times over. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure. Like I said, I could speak with you like all day long, but you know, it's I'm sure you have things to do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, stay safe. Yeah, stay healthy. Much love to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be sharing your website. I'll be sharing. Okay. I already did actually. Uh, but I'll share it on the, the description. I'll connect you with. Uh, with Kimberly, who owns oh, yeah. the beauty supply mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta, and then we'll go from there. Right. So if you want to do the replay and you have any questions for Ahama, please, or for me also, please don't hesitate, write all your questions. I'll make sure that she gets them, uh, and I'm sure that she will actually uh, reply to you also. Thank you for your heart, and Bye. thank you for who you are, and really changing the world like you <laughs> trying <laughs> all right bye guys I'm still working on it. <laughs> bye bye <laughs> See you again soon bye thank you very much bye yeah. everybody <laughs>